with us today, I've got this incredible father of two amazing girls. Uh, they're growing up in London, which is absolutely exciting. It's been a challenge for everybody in the pandemic. Um, I'm talking to someone today who has had a couple of pivots and done some really interesting stuff. And there's going to be a huge amount of value. So if you're somebody who is exploring kind of the concept of social media, specifically kind of in the moment right now, LinkedIn, you're going to, going to listen to my good friend, Richard Moore. Welcome aboard. How are you? Kobe, so good to see you. I'm really good. Thanks for asking. You're the first call of the day here. I appreciate it's evening. But uh, for me, I'm all fresh as a daisy. So uh, yeah, thanks so much for the intro. That's awesome. That's awesome. Look, it's good to have you on. And I know there's a lot going on for you right now with what you're doing on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, we're kind of going head to head on LinkedIn at the moment. Actually, you got <laughs> ahead of me there for a little while. So, um, um, so uh, look, it, it, it is a lot of fun. And um, I think to kick some questions off, we want to talk to this audience today and the people that are listening and they're, you know, whether they're listening right now when we release the episode or down the track. Mm. Um, talk to me about what you've been doing the last three or four years. Mm. Okay, so yeah, it's a really good time frame to look at because there was something of a pivot within the overall pivot because I came out of corporate about eight years back now and I started, if I look at just purely the online world, not any of the corporate coaching, it was very much Facebook and, you know, basically helping startups and entrepreneurs learn how to convert because everyone's doing the content, but they're, they're not quite clear on like how to get people to step forward and, and in the, the most unirritating way possible, get someone to want to buy something. So I was coaching that side of thing. And obviously, you must know from your experience, it's really good fun to work with people who are at the entry point to their business because there's so much ambition and energy. And of course, if you help them with their first sales, you become quite, quite useful. So that was a really wonderful start point. But I remember back in 2017, uh, like Q4 of 2017, thinking something's really going on on LinkedIn. And like everyone else, you know, I joined in the 2000s, like, you know, but then that had been left kind of left alone. Uh, but what happened was August 2017, LinkedIn was like, right, we're going to allow video now, not just the status update and articles. So that just like there was a little pocket of people who started doing that. And I'm just thinking something's really going to happen here. And, and if there's attention combined with the context of business, which is what you don't have on Facebook, then I'm not going to have to fight so much around all of people's wedding photos and stuff like that to, to help them with the business side. And so early 2018, I just started with contact, uh, sorry, with content. And it was a really interesting moment because it developmentally helped my business absolutely fly. It, it like really made the difference, um, but, but personally helped as well because we, it was a very different thing I was up against. And on, on Facebook, I was essentially connecting with people I didn't really know, getting into a good conversation and seeing where it went. And of course, then that might have led to clients. On LinkedIn, all the people I'd ever worked with, all the people who'd ever managed me and previous clients were all on there. And so it felt very real. And it was like a really nice way of checking with myself. Am I really posting stuff that's brilliant, you know, quality information that's going to help people? And I acted as though this audience was people who already knew me, like really knew Richard Moore. And so it, it, it made me go deep on, on learning as much as I could about what things are going to resonate best with audiences, how to really write in the right way. And, and I've been at it for a long time. You know, it's, it's been a very long, fun road um, with wonderful things along the way. Um, you know, I visited LinkedIn HQ in San Francisco 2019 and hit up the media team there. It was good fun to learn from them as, we, as I go, because, you know, the algorithm is fairly secretive and kind of good to pick their brains on stuff all the way through to uh, my accelerator launch last year. And uh, we've got 72 businesses now in there. It's just really lovely to be able to help people specifically on the conversion piece, because um, I think as, as you and I will probably resonate on this point as, as coaches that help people really move the needle, not just feel a bit nicer about their social presence. What we really want to do is move away from just how to make nice content that makes us feel good because it gets a bunch of likes and views and really have a bit more utility about it. You know, what's the purpose behind the content? Where's the strategy? How are we going to use that to drive really meaningful opportunities into the business? 
So by focusing on that, I feel I've become, become quite valuable and really the pandemic in the last two years or so has been has just made me more relevant because my beginnings uh, way back from 2003 was selling on to, uh, internet marketing that was very much my job to start with so how to sell combined with LinkedIn was a very very helpful for relevance because of course people were stuck at home trying to sell uh, in their corporate roles so it's just been an interesting ride and um, i I I certainly owe a lot to LinkedIn because it, because of its generous algorithm. But I do feel that the the vibe there is contextually more business, but also a little bit more supportive, a little bit more kind of positive than elsewhere. And it's a good place to flourish. So thank goodness it's there. So that a number of other things have happened, but that's been a really um, powerful place to grow the business. And I did a lot of charity work um, as a result of getting LinkedIn traction too. So uh, that was fun to build those events to drive money into local charities, but all on the base of LinkedIn. So it's been very much my prime place of late. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying uh, exploring this kind of newer world because we're still fairly early, aren't we, in terms of people producing content and doing something with the platform. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I mean, like you said, like I've been on LinkedIn. I got a notification the other day, sixteen years. Wow, really? Um, and and really, my you know, I guess my audience has really only started taking off mm. in, in probably the last three. Mm. Um, you know, and and it does, as as you say, it does take work. I think there's there's a couple of key points there that I want um, anyone who's listening to really kind of pick up on. One is that LinkedIn is a very supportive platform. Mm. Um, two is that. You, you can really access, directly access, um, you know, a bunch of people. Now, it's not necessarily about going straight for a decision maker, for example, um, but, uh, but it is definitely an accessible platform from professional, it's the professional telephone book, you know. So um, I've basically now done away with business cards, as an example, not my own, but collecting them. Yeah. Um, and, and you're obviously collecting LinkedIn contacts. Now, that provides a whole other challenge when you start approaching that you know, that 30, that magic 30,000 number, um, which, which I'm not far off in terms of actually how do you remember who's who and yeah. you can't flip through cards, but, but that's a challenge. So, so for anyone listening, um, Richard's organization helps people with LinkedIn. Mm. So, um, and, and, and there's some context around that. So I'd like to ask you a quite a challenging question. Sure. What's the problem statement? So if we, if we really dig down into your organization and, and we can kind of talk about what you do, but I want to, I want to ask you two things. The first is what's the problem statement? And then we'll, we'll come to, you know, the vision, mission, the worthy cause. So sure. what's the challenge? The challenge for the, for the clients or, or for yeah. a client. So, Absolutely. so there's a problem statement you're solving. What's that problem statement? It's interesting because a lot of people don't realize they're going to have this. I call it now a frustration. I feel it's a real frustration um, it's often a blind spot to begin with. They don't quite realize they've got it, but then it really becomes apparent. It's not for my client base how to like produce content or how to use the platform or how to optimize a profile. There's plenty of people who do kind of an entry point for LinkedIn. And I've got a basics course on Udemy like everyone else has, you know, how to do your profile, how to connect with people, all the common sense stuff, basically, that people just want some validation against. The real problem, the problem statement is dealing with the people who are frustrated because they're actually trying. And that I really feel, I'm so pleased you brought this up because I really feel this is the centerpiece of the big frustration for content creators and for businesses on LinkedIn in 2021 is the general vibe that's been pushed by content marketers and for those and by those who, I'm going to throw them under the bus, who coach a lot of LinkedIn is great content is all you need to do. It's that terrible idea of build it and they will come, awful. Because what it's saying is, if you just keep producing content consistently and you know, go and write comment, comments and replies everywhere, then you'll, you know, your inbox will light up. The problem or major frustration is when people have been doing that for six months. It's when people have been spending 10 grand on investing in boot camps and courses on how to build perfect videos and they're all in hundreds of engagement pods and they're getting loads of engagement and someone said it to me perfectly about a year ago she said all my friends think I'm crushing it on LinkedIn but their frustration is that they hit this brick wall 
when you get all of these people seeing the content, they have 3,000 followers. They have, you know, 10,000 views on a post. They have triple figures in terms of likes. They have 50 comments per post, loads of engagement, but no deals. And what it is, is it's content led to the point that these businesses or these people assigned to look after LinkedIn are so consumed with getting content viewed that they're not thinking about the rest of the transaction. Content is a tool. It is gravity that gets people to orbit around you. But you have to take the next step and, and bring these people forward to engage. The thing is, it's not the early 90s anymore. So you don't need to go pitching people cold. What you can do is attract them with valuable marketing that positions you as the expert. And then as they step forward and saying, hey, that's quite valuable or check out your profile or, you know, hit you up with a like or something. That's your permission to then get in touch. And so what I focus on is this big frustration of how to convert from passive second connections, an audience who's thumbing through a, through a um, news feed to see your content. Maybe even they're starting to find you quite interesting, but how to get them to step forward? Because the thing that most people do on LinkedIn is nothing. So most audience members just observe. Most deals and buyers are second connections that you never knew. They're not the first connections who write messages all the time. They're the ones who are your cheerleaders or your clients. The problem I solve is getting the people who are looking, but fairly kind of cool in their keenness for you to step forward. And that's done by choice wording, very delicate, uh, elegantly written calls to action, knowing what to say in messages, but also then how to move them through a process of messaging so that they don't feel pressure because you have any pressure at all and you sound like a salesperson from 15 years ago and we've got to avoid that all costs because the world <laughs> has been conditioned to understand anyone pr pushing anything on them is going to be trying to sell something without their best interest in mind so we want to be kind of creating a situation where they feel like they're happily fulfilled in their buying process but that big problem isn't how to make content it's how to make the right content written in the right way so people go do you know what i think i'll step forward actually kobe i think i'd i'd like to hear a bit more please that's what's missing it's often that sure distribution can be improved sure a profile can be optimized but these are little things that don't move the needle that much you know and i think a lot of startups especially all the way through to the nine figure businesses i i, I work with as well they have this issue of like, well, maybe if we just polish the video a bit more or maybe if our website looks better or some kind of improvement on the landing page. It's not that, especially the high ticket offers. It's how are you going to at that point where you're meeting the actual audience member? What are you going to do in that moment? What do you say and why? How behaviorally do you need to address that person? Because the human on the other side is going to be slightly cynical about any any approach you take unless it's done in the right way so it's fascinating that behavioral stuff and um uh, you know we've both spent plenty of years in business to know that there's certain things you just that say and certain things you don't so by virtue of the fact i've been on the pitch for a fair while i've just kind of learned some things that definitely work that's the problem really and i don't think people realize that they they've been told over and over again just do great content and you do literally have month after month people getting literally no results, but with this belief that if they just keep writing comments and so on, they'll somehow start getting deals. And it's not going to change unless you understand how to interact with, with the individual, you know. And ultimately, the reason why anyone buys anyone is because they really like the person interacting with them. So it's that stuff on the on the tr in the trenches, you know, with the one on one interactions that really matters. So, and I. I like that it feels fairly unique at the moment. Maybe one day everyone will be focused on this, but right now that's the bit that's missing because it's hard compared to making another video or doing another carousel, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. Look, and I think, um, you know, if I, if I pull a couple of quotes from you and quote you on a number of your videos on your YouTube channel and, mm. and, and some of the other places that, um, you know, we've been interacting that um, it's social media. And yeah. you know the 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 kind of cardinal sin, although you know we we do do it, we do break this rule. Uh, yeah. Is is scheduling, creating content, and scheduling the post. Yeah. And it's and it's like 
It's like dressing up your personal robot and sending it off to a party. Yeah, that's true. Like you got like forget that. Leave the robot at home to do whatever the robot's doing. Mm. You got to go and you got to meet people and have relationships. Yeah. And and I think my advice to people is don't forget that this is it's it's about relationships. Now whether it's it's obviously one to many. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the the success that I get um, when we you know and we go we ebb and flow in terms of the quality of our content in terms of its, you know, the engagement kind of piece that we're talking about right now is that when I'm at the front of our sales pipeline Mm. and I'm talking to customers and I'm doing my massive information gathering and I'm listening to their challenges or people are reaching out to me and I'm talking to people, that's when we make our best content because we're, we're in the moment with what our customers' problems are right now. We're talking to our customers and then we, we take the, we take the frequently asked questions and provide the answers to what the challenge is right now. And I think yeah. that to your point is the more that you're conversing with people mm. and you can do converse with people one to many, don't be the focus group of one and think, oh, this piece of content's a great idea. Yeah. So what was the, what were the, you know, the five most frequent questions in the last yeah. week of, of, of talking to people and, 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 and essentially networking. I, I so totally I agree. To- that level of awareness just is, is missing at the moment. And you're right. There's a level of, or, or I don't want to say arrogance, but there's a level of like kind of, oh, maybe I'll just talk about more stuff related to my industry. And they've got all these how to posts. But actually, you know, speaking about one particular thing that's come up, that's representative of the bunch of people that would probably buy your service means you're going to speak specifically to them. Doesn't matter if everyone else doesn't care. It's like it's just like you're highlighting that particular issue for them at the moment. So I, I think it's such a simple thing, isn't it? But most people don't audit their the audience's responses like that. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, that, that, that's kind of one one Um, I picked up on something on, um, on one of your YouTube videos, which um, yep. I'm going to circle, I'm going to pick it out right now, but I'm going to circle back to it. Okay. Is, um, is what's your recommendation for the number of new people to speak to every day? Great question. And, and it's, it's dependent to a degree on how much time you can deploy because the answer ideally is as many as you can, but what it isn't is ha- as many as the bot can. It needs to be meaningful. It's, it's more the metric is how many meaningful conversations can you do? Because the truth is that if you're doing this right, you're not spending four hours a day on LinkedIn because actually you should be doing delivery to your clients and working in and on your business. Still, to answer the question, if you're, if you're like, do you know what? I'm going to spend 45 minutes to an hour. That's what I'm going to deploy first thing in the morning in the DMs to engage with people. It might be you spend that hour with eight people, for instance. You should have a minimum, you know, but the, but the thing is, even if it's small progress each day, it's still progress. Even if I speak to three people, as long as there is depth, because let's be really clear here, right? If we're looking at seven, eight, nine figure businesses, and let's say their price points 30k or or six figure fee for instance on what planet is that going to be a deal if it's all automated or like quick quips between them they're not going to buy through a landing page what you what you, what's required is like getting close with that person so it's the depth that matters because ultimately no one who sells very big ticket needs 50 leads a day they need like 3 that are really qualified where that person's kind of in love with you. And it's like, Kobe, I've been watching your stuff for the last three months and absolutely love what you have to say. They've opened up as a result and they're sharing a particular struggle and you've gone deep on it for a few levels of DMs. And then of course you pivot to a call and you go deeper. And that time spent with that one person is worth so much more than, you know, look at me, I just got another 500 connections. It's just a load of rubbish looking at big numbers. Big numbers like that don't equate to real cash in the bank usually, especially with high ticket offerings. So the answer is as many as you can, but you can overdo it because if you're, if that hour becomes six hours because you're just DMing all day, what aren't you doing? So the problem is that you're now probably not spending enough time with the current clients or you're not spending enough time working on other areas of the business. And, and I mean, it's more your space than mine, actually. But as someone who holistically gives a guidance to companies on best practice, it's clear that if you 
um, weight too much of your time in a day on one particular task, even if it is designed to move the needle quite a bit, you're, you're you know, offsetting what you could do with other areas too. And that's why it's, if you've got a bigger business, then you might want to have people who are focused maybe just on business development and others who just focused on, on uh, client retention, for instance, because otherwise you've got someone who's doing too much of one thing and not of the other. But that's not really much of a problem these days. Usually the issue is too much time spent on polishing bits of content and making sure the last little edits just bang on when the video is going to last 24 hours instead of focusing on, on those calls. So that's my roundabout answer, but hopefully you understand what I'm trying to say. And, and I, I was trying to do it without saying quality over quantity because I know that's cliche, but it's right. hundred percent, hundred percent. Look, I, I'm going to just do a quick, quick public service announcement right here. For those <laughs> laggards that are listening, DM equals direct message. So DM is direct message. We're talking in social media jargon. So for those of you listening that we're talking about the direct message. So the LinkedIn inbox or Instagram mm -hmm. inbox or Facebook messenger inbox People are becoming more and more accessible as our name, not our phone number, is now publicly available. Yeah. Public service announcement over. Question. Is a DM a modern cold call? Uh, it is for some. But the, the problem is that people are overlooking how conditioned their prospects are to receiving a cold DM. We're all conditioned that when we get when we get in mail from sent from sales navigator and your business is the subject line, even if that prospect opens the DM, they're opening it with the mindset of, well, this is probably going to be spammy rubbish. So you might have the best offer in the world, but your process is wrong. It doesn't work like that because that's not how you sell people in the real world. In the, in the real world, you'd meet someone properly and have some level of pleasantries. It's just ridiculous when everyone has a public profile that you can't spend 17 seconds looking on it and finding where you've got some commonality. Leverage that first, because suddenly someone's going to be interested in speaking to you because you're not going in with the, I don't care but, uh, about you, but I want you to buy my product because that's entitled. Far better is to say, hey, I saw we've both got Kobe as a mutual connection. Hey, I saw we're both going to this particular event online. I saw we went to the same university. I saw we worked at the same company. I saw we both, whatever it might be. Like then everyone's got ma a mass of public information. Commonality to, as, as the entry point is so ridiculously unique because no one bothers doing it. Instead there's the presumption that you'll want to see a free webinar of value but emotionally that buyer is not interested. So cold DMs can work. And I come from a world originally of cold calling. That was my first job for years. I worked with events companies doing the same, selling high ticket conferences. And I coach people in the city who cold call to ultimately try and get six figure deals. But it is not the most effective way. It's certainly not the most efficient way either, because the problem is, you know what it is? There's actually a really good parallel here, Kobe. If I buy 10,000 lottery tickets, I'll possibly win the lottery or I might, I might have a good shot of winning 100 grand or something. But I didn't do that through skill. I did that because I was willing to un overturn all of these stones to find the, 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 the little gem. It's the same here. And like, if I think about my first job of cold calling, 500 dials a week, nothing but being on the phone to get one deal. And it's like, yeah, I sold that person. You didn't. The person probably would have bought anyway. You happened to find the person who was just in the right space and was willing to try something out and take a pump for five grand on, on the thing you're offering. Everyone else was really annoyed by your irritating approach. That's the problem with the DMs. It's not, it's not like everyone is neutral and then one person bought. It's everyone's really annoyed and is blocking you and don't, doesn't want to hear from you again. And you're killing all of that potential pipeline and you got one deal and the guy would have bought anyway. So it's not selling in the slightest. And I'll go toe to toe with people who think that cold DM is the best approach. Can you sell? Yes. Do you really want to have that approach? To, is that the life you want? No, nor is it for your prospects. And so, I mean, ultimately, if you look at buyer psychology, the slightly longer route that's far more fulfilling for both parties actually leads to less game playing and negotiation, higher price points, they just uh, people are fine with paying it when when you've attracted them in the right way you've opened up built a level of trust you don't have to ha deal with your essentially their cynicism that you're probably trying to screw them it's 
just conditioning we have to work around. So again, the great news for everyone listening is because the majority of people do cold DMs and pitch straight away, if you bother to just be a bit more human, you're wildly unique. <laughs> and so you, to, you, know, you are welcome with open arms because yeah. you bothered just to, to take cues from the offline world. So it's a wonderful world. And I wrote a post about this recently. Every time someone sends a cold DM spamming someone to try and sell something, my job just got easier because you're making me look so much better just by being a bit more interested in human. Uh, it's, it's quite amusing, in, in, my, in my, my opinion, that the lack of... of empathy for the person who's going to be buying it yeah so some people might call us early adopters and yeah. um you know even though we've been on linkedin for you know 15 16 years um there are still people who are thinking that it's a new thing and you know sure. I, I guess finally it's not the job search platform yes um that, that, that it was i guess initially um for somebody who you know they've got their app they've got the app on their phone um they're you know they're 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 not necessarily a startup but they're kind of a freelancer you know right. they're 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 a professional business they've got four or five people maybe they're a director at a construction company for example yep. they've got their own building company they do commercial work um you know they, they their business might turn over a couple of million bucks um so what are your top three things for them to you know they open the linkedin app what do you want them to do? Top first yeah. three things. Yeah, good question. So the first thing you've got to remember is if that person's ultimate aim is generating more business, then they're not looking for a job. So change the context of your profile to creator mode. What that does is it takes all of your job experience that no one actually cares about unless they're trying to hire you and shoves it further down and puts in place a bit the latest content you're going to be producing so that's job number one you want it to be then people arrive on your profile they're like okay i'm going to get more i can indulge now to learn more about kobe for instance the second thing is focus massively on connections and commenting i'm putting two in one sorry but connections and commenting what i'm what we're looking at here is two things firstly what's your peer group like you know connect with people who um aren't going to be buyers, but they're going to be like, yeah, I, I love what your vibe. I'm, I'm a cheerleader. I like what you're all about. Um, they might be people you could collaborate with. They might be other people who even compete with you. It's hilarious that people think that there's only so much success that can go around. Go collaborate. But also, of course, reach out to people who might buy or influence those who might buy as well. But the second part of the connection connections is to focus on commenting, because Commenting includes messages to them because you want to bring depth to these relationships. No one's impressed if you've got lots of connections. What's really, and like you said earlier, it's like saying, I've just, I own a phone book. Like, so good for you. You've got a bunch of numbers, but you don't know the people. What matters is depth. So focus on spending time each day and in interacting with these people and show up for them. So in the comments part, it's not just DMs to them, but like get down from your throne and go and if they dare write, um, a post, go comment on it. And I have a list, you know, build a list of the people who are most interesting in your ecosystem and engage with a few each day. And that can also include looking at their activity because if, if business owners out there aren't doing content, but they are writing comments, so show up and reply to their comment on someone else's post. At being active in the community like that is actually good for you because LinkedIn recognizes that community activity and that gives you a bit of a bump when it comes to content, which is the third tip. You need to basically start making some noise because it doesn't matter if you've got the best product in the world. Unless people know you, obscurity is your best, is your biggest problem. Certainly not, you know, the quality of your service. So do I produce content about what I do? No, we don't have to necessarily. What I want to do is, is recognize the reason why people would want to begin the process of discovering me and wondering if they could buy from me is based on how much they like me. If they think I'm an idiot, it doesn't matter how good the product is, they probably won't want to buy me from me. A lot of the reasons why some people don't want to buy from Amazon is they have a problem with Jeff Bezos. A lot of reasons why people buy a Tesla is despite all of the manufacturing problems, they fanboy and girl over Elon Musk. You know, it's down to how much you like the person. So if you're fun or interesting or stimulating or a thought leader and an expert with an interesting take on things, you're going to attract a bit of a crowd. And they're the people 
who will decide themselves that you're kind of interesting enough that they want to explore more. And they're creating this perfect platform for you to then move them to through a buying process. So the content doesn't have to be, here's what I do. Come on, guys, roll up and buy. It needs to be much more akin to like, like revising people's views on what's needed or what should be understood about your world. So if you work in construction, we need to handle this problem of people thinking, I'm sure you're just another construction company. So what's what's the thing that everyone thinks is right about construction, but actually isn't working? What What's your take on it? Be the revisionist so that people think, well, you know what? I never looked at it that way. That's something different. And when you reframe someone's worldview on your space, they naturally elevate you to this position of expert and that gets people to gather around. So that's what you can do in your content. A good, a good idea is just to write down five or six things that are like things that the, 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 the industry believe to be true, that you're like, no, it's not like that. That's not right. It should be like this. And comment on that. And that will draw a crowd because you're being unique and divisive, but you're talking about a more evolved way of looking at your ecosystem. And essentially what, what these things do, these three things, is it, it makes people interested in you. And when they're interested in you, you're creating what's called a curiosity gap. And curiosity, curiosity gap is when they're like, who's this Kobe guy? That's really interesting. Clicks on your profile. Oh, look, there's more stuff like this about as well. And that's when they start showing some interest in you. Just hoping you're going to get found in search is like hoping that someone's going to come and give you a lottery win. It's not going to work. You know, if you want to get thousands of people per month looking at you, with the context of that they found you interesting, then you need to attract them in the right way, which is you go and show up for them first, connections and comments, and you also attract them with really interesting uh, content that's gonna just think like, would someone be actually interested in this? Don't show them what you sell, talk about the world you're in and they'll be like, great point, I'll check you out now, you see. So I just think it's interesting it's, um, to, to approach this all this whole thing with this, like almost a challenge of imagine I'm not allowed to reach out to people cold. Imagine that was banned. How would I now do it? And I think it's it's the longer route. Sorry, <laughs> it's more patience required, but it works because that's how people want to buy. And we need to tune into how people want to buy rather than how we would rather sell because it's far, far less efficient, uh, effective, but oh, sorry, efficient, but it's more effective uh, to do it that way around. So that's my, that my three kind of three and a half tips. Yeah, nice, nice. Bonus one in there for everyone. Mm. So with with um with kind of where we're going, let's call this marketing. Let's just throw it under yeah. that banner. If, if we had marketing and sales and finance and operations and the kind yeah. of sections of a of a business, and that's our best practice piece. Um, let's put this in marketing. Um my you know, I, I think um, you know. It, I just want to summarize there that I've got this saying that lots of people hear me say all the time. It's not what you know. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. Yeah. Question for you. If we talk about modern marketing and, and maybe talk about your career, because, you know, from cold calling to, to, to the work you're doing, yeah. coaching people now, like to be clear with everybody, Richard's a coach, you know, and, and this is, you know, he's coaching people to help you get, you know, get, and that's one of the things he does. So mm. I just want to be really clear and blunt with everybody. And if, yeah. if LinkedIn is a challenge for you right now, you've got to reach out to him, go check out his stuff. Like that's, that's what this podcast is all about. We're not, not love trucks and pixie dust. We're talking about how to help you solve your problem with LinkedIn. And he's yeah. going to help you do that. So I appreciate um, that. I'm going to be blunt with you. So, so don't just, don't just, um, just satellite around what we're doing here. So with regards to marketing, we, we talk about touch points. Have mm. you got an opinion on, and, and it's, you know, pick an arbitrary figure out of thin air. But um, if you were going to bet on numbers of touch points for a modern sale, how many is it in your opinion? What a, what a fun question. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people over the years, especially from the sales side, but also marketing who are like, it's definitely seven points of contact. It's 100% 12 points of contact. No, it's not. <laughs> it depends on the person. It depends how good you are as well. And, and the truth is that no matter how effective you are, it's different for all. But I do feel if I had to pin a number down, I think you should look at 10. And does 10 mean you are manually reaching out to that person? Not in the slightest. A touch point is where they've had some interaction with your world. A touch point could be someone mentioning you. A touch point could be looking at a piece of content. 
The reason I believe this is because the people who join my accelerator or ask for coaching or buy a high ticket offering, they're the people who often say, I've been watching you for a few months, or I've been following you for a year, or I love your company, I've been tuning into your stuff for some time. There's, if you can imagine like a conveyor belt and at the end of it right here, it's this inter interaction, the final touch point where we decide to do a deal. It started often, I don't know, April, where they saw, oh, what's this? I was, you know, you, I've been sent this bit of content in my newsfeed because someone I know saw it. And then I saw it again because I wrote, and I decided to write a comment this time. And then like, you know, the major two thirds of them, two thirds of these touch points should probably be, they're just seeing your content and deciding you're a bit more interesting. And you get to this point where they're like kind of binging on you. And then again, if you do it right, you write the right kind of call to action. They're like, oh my God, yeah, this, I'm so ready now. I'm going to elect to step forward and, and ask for a bit more information. I think you should work on the basis that if you have consistency and frequency in your message going out, then, then that's how you, you get people in, in, you know, into, into that kind of cycle where they will buy from you. If you're gonna go pure DMs only, it could be less. It could be five or six DMs back and forth, but you've gotta really understand that, that trust has to exist in every deal. So unless there's trust first, they, you relate to them, you're resonating with them. You're never going to really move to the point where you're safely going to pivot to a pitch without them viewing you slightly suspect. So, so it's kind of, that's what I would say. It's just interesting because I love how people are so strident about their particular number or formula. It's like, no, <laughs> it's not like that at all. Because some people, for some people, you're just perfect. And for others, they just need a bit more time. And, you know, and there's some people who've, followed me for like eight years and never bought a bean because they, for some reason, aren't going to spend money online. So I, I think it's kind of interesting, but work on the basis that they, that if you put great things out there, they'll, they'll be attracted and they'll spend some time immersed in your ecosystem. And, and then it, it manually and, and one-on-one, uh, -on -one, it might be three. And there usually should be some level of follow-up perhaps as well, if you need to, people are busy doing other things too. But let them warn themselves first. It's, it's not what people want to hear when they want to be transactional, but it's far better to plant the seeds and then harvest a good crop that further down the line. Yeah, 100%. And, and I've been telling people 24, you know. Like, yeah, I like that too. I, I mean, 10 is a know? minimum. It really is. Yeah, so it's, you know, and, and behind me here, you know, I know it's a podcast and people listen to the podcast, but there's a pile of magazines behind me. Like we produced, you know, we, we've just, we're, we're just about to post out, right. post, 2500 heavy wow. 100 page magazines you know and wow. it's so it's still you know it's still content right we've produced yeah. the content we've printed it it's a beautiful magazine it's a collector's item it's issue number seven mm. infinite magazine if you haven't got that already it's on our website check that it out it looks great i checked it out by the way i really but but you know there's the magazine there's the podcast there's anything else you've done any interview you've done as well Absolutely. it all adds up and people Absolutely. see you a bit and a bit and a bit and it adds up after a while to, to something meaningful absolutely and so what i want to just you know, for, the, for you guys listening, think about what it would be like to see, you know, your favorite TV show personality, character, actor coming in the opposite direction to you down the street. Or you see Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, he's walking towards you down the street. Think about your reaction. You're like, I know this guy. And this guy's like, I don't know you. So, yeah. so that is what's happening. And, and I noticed, um, you know, I've, I've, we've been pretty heavy duty on set, social media now for about seven or eight years. Um, uh, you know, really hard on link, uh, really hard on YouTube. The day that LinkedIn turned on videos, like within five minutes, we lo uploaded videos. Oh, we nice! Well done. Producing them every day, anyway. So, mm. um, that worked out really well for us. But, but what I want you to realize is that through the process of regularly producing content in perpetuity, yeah. that is as as we're talking about here, targeted. You, you know, answering the frequently asked questions, talking about the benefits of your service or product to your key people you're talking about don't talk about the features talk about the benefits yeah what are the yeah. benefits that it brings people so the benefits of richard's service here is that you're going to be less frustrated with linkedin you're going to get more deals through linkedin you're going to get more revenue through this mm. lead generating opportunity that's that's the benefit of working with richard that's mm. this whole goal here right now and and kind of as part of this conversation so remembering it's not what you know it's not who you know it's who knows you and, and I want people to be thinking about that. And then 
just thinking about, okay, just starting kind of the conversation. So that's the content production piece. Yeah. But the piece here about you've got it, you, it's create the content, but the content is the, is the match or the spark for the fire yeah. that is the conversation. Yes, and, it's and not the whole it, of your work. I totally, yeah. I totally agree with that. It's it, it, content is being given too much uh, focus. Yes. Content is not king. Don't care no. what people say. Co community is king, and engaging right. with people is is king. And it's an interesting point about the Rock because if he walked up to you in the street and you didn't know who he was, you'd be like, "Who's this guy?" But of course, because you've seen him more than even twenty four times. You you know you buy in that if he started speaking to you be like oh my god this is so cool no one in the world has ever bought an iPhone the very first moment they ever heard about an iPhone because humans are distrusting they're hardwired to be distrusting of the unknown it took a huge amount of warming up for you for now people will happily broke people will happily spend a thousand dollars on an iPhone because they're so entrenched in being part of a tribe. The touch points must be in the hundreds, if not thousands. Um, it's become this thing like, you know, you are you're part of a tribe to be to buying an Apple product and people are militantly anti-Android and stuff like that. It's fascinating. Uh, well, so I, mean, I, I love that. I, that's me. I mean, I'm, I'm militantly anti-Android and there is a stack. <laughs> let me say this, a stack of Apple devices on our kitchen bench all on charge. Like there's <laughs> the iPads are all sorted in order of size. And then on top of oh, that, nice. there's iPods and iPhones and it's it's crazy. So, okay, um, going back in history, uh, I think it's about four years on your YouTube channel. Right. You did a Merry, Chris you did a Merry Christmas video and I thought it was fantastic. Okay. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and it was really good. And, um, and you said for, I think it was, I think it was, uh, I think it was the end of 2017, Merry right. Christmas 2017. Um, about to go and do a drive and go and see the family and spend some family time. I hope that Christmas was amazing. Um, I want to hear from you for the remainder of 2020 and thinking about, sorry, the remainder of 2021. I'm sorry, I'm still stuck in the pandemic. I know, um, I know. <laughs> so <laughs> for 2021, for the remainder of 2021 and maybe into 2022, I want to hear from you. And this is this is kind of not core business, but what are three things that you want people to do and the three things you want people to stop doing? OK, so let's rattle through. Um, and wow, you did your research. I don't remember doing that video. That's been a while. OK, so um, three things to do. One is get more manual. You know, don't don't automate the bit that matters, which is the human interaction. The touch point between you and another person should be as manual as possible. Uh, second one is new people every day. Nothing helps your business more or yourself personally than something fresh every single day. And thirdly, let's go a bit deeper. Thirdly, win the morning. Win nice. the morning. Uh, that nice. is like that's a David Goggins uh, reference, but the whole game changed when I focused on routine and I stopped becoming a night owl. By the way, no one on the planet is only a night owl or a morning person. You can choose. I was a night owl. I changed it up at five at it, the exercise, the routine. I'm like a monk, uh, Kobe, for the first two hours a day. Like win the morning and you have the rest of the day to do a lot of other things. Flexibility then becomes this thing you start having and both of us as dads know how important it is to be flexible uh because your kids you know they're, they're active and that stuff can happen you, you want to be able to be present for them so win the morning as well it's the game changer over everything is is getting two hours of great work in before anything before the sun's even up three things you should avoid um one like without question this should be forever is stop looking at the big numbers that aren't the king metrics King metrics are, am I converting? King metrics are, am I getting the right people? Are, am I getting the right location in terms of people looking at me? I, I, I spoke to someone last night and he, he was absolutely overjoyed because his LinkedIn post had 13, was it? Th yeah, 13 comments and he got 19 likes. He gave me the stats. I'm like, I, I love this because he said probably about a third of them are potentially people he could sell to. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. So don't look at huge distribution of content as a yardstick of success unless you are one of the tiny minority of people who is a paid influencer who is paid on how many views your content gets i bet you're not and if you're not then you shouldn't be focusing on it you should be focusing on the king metric which is your conversion 
the second thing to not do is talk too much about how your product works. You mentioned it perfectly. You want to talk about benefits. A, another way to look at a benefit is a win for the buyer. So does it cover one of the four main wins, which is do they look good? Do they make more money? Do they save more money or do they save time? Convenience. That's completely overlooked that last one. So talk about the things that can help them. So relate it to or relate your advice to how they can win and improve their lives. That's what people are actually after. And with all love to the people who have spent ages building something, they just don't care how it works. They want the result. No one cares how an iPhone's built. They just want to look like they've got the money to spend on a luxury item. No one cares how a Ferrari works. They just want more sex. That's why they bought the Ferrari. <laughs> it's true. It's an, they buy it for the first win, which is, do I look good? Yes, I'll buy it. The reason Where do I get a Ferrari, by the way? <laughs> no, no, we all, with all love, if you got a Ferrari, although there's a small, apparently there's about 8% of people that would buy a product because they do like, like the geeks who like how it was actually built. But, you know, there's a reason why in 2007, BlackBerry just lost an iPhone one because iPhone was cool and makes you look good. BlackBerry is the superior phone in so many ways, but it's not cool. Sorry. So you lose. So people are buying for a different set of reasons and you've got to tap into those wins. Last thing as well is recognize that glamorous, though it may feel or seem culturally to be working all the time. And this is going to I'm in my 40s now. So I'm just saying this because I, I appreciate I might sound like an old sage, but listen to this. It's so crucial to understand that real success isn't just making hundreds of thousands of quid every year. It's simultaneously spending time with your children. It's simultaneously having date nights with your wife still. It's simultaneously having a nice walk without looking at your mobile phone. I'm not trying to be all kind of wholesome and, and new age about it. Genuinely, it makes you a better person. You, you, know, you, are, you are really successful, in my opinion, and, and deserve respect if you can manage all that stuff at once, as opposed to, look at me, I'm doing one thing really well, but the rest of my world's in tatters. So Think about the other elements of, of what success looks like rather than only putting your, all your attention into, into your business. So there's a quick three things to do, three things not to do for you. I hope that was uh, sufficient. <laughs> That's awesome. Like, um, and for, for anyone who hasn't heard me say this before, I measure my success by the number of consecutive days. I don't have to wear shoes. I like it. Yes. <laughs> well, it's in Australia, so surely it's always thongs, as you'd say anyway. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so picture me in a thong. Um, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you know, we got it. We got an incredible climate and, um, you know, the pandemic has been absolutely fantastic for us in terms of like, you know, I'm, I'm right here. I'm, my, I'm in my home office. We've got a studio. Um, but, uh, but this has been absolutely fantastic. And I think I'm up to about, I think right now I'm sitting at about day 15, um, wow. in, in the current stint of no shoes. So, uh, right. so look, the disclaimer is I do do a 10 kilometer walk in the morning and I do wear That's shoes cool. for that. But the as soon as I get home, the shoes are off. So, um, so uh, last question, because uh, yep. we are kind of talking business, and you are in your forties. What advice? And you've got a week to prepare, and you've got two hours to present. What advice would you give your twenty-year-old self? My twenty-year-old, because I'm almost forty-one in two weeks. So, twenty-year-old self was in two thousand. Well, obviously, I'll be like, there's going to be this thing called Bitcoin. Make sure you buy a bunch. But other than that, like the actual <laughs> advice <laughs> or stuff like that. But but yeah, I think I think probably the best advice. Because I'm now so thrilled I went through it is embrace learning how to sell. And and what because what learning how to sell really is really is understanding the sport of humans and interaction, behavior and psychology and I'm so pleased that in the first month of work in 2003, when I was 22 years old, my first paycheck, I bought a book on how to sell. And then within three months, I was going to events on, on like learning negotiation. I'm so glad I nerded out about that. And it might be that people listening to this are going, oh, God, it's just like how to sell because you're doing all right in business. But hear me out. Selling. And then it's not just about closing the deal. It's about understanding human dynamics. And when you get it right, it permeates every single part of your world. It makes you a, a better communicator. It helps your relationships at home and with friends. 
it means that in a, a fun chat like this, I'd like to think I can be a bit more dynamic, um, persuasive, uh, articulate with my points. And selling is about really understand communication. And it's fun. It's funny because at the moment there's the, the current zeitgeist is for everyone to be talking about how they've got such great EQ or understand people really well. They've got wonderful empathy. Really, if you have that, it means you put yourself in the other person's shoes emotionally and you understand how they probably feel in the moment rather than no overindulging and talking at them so embracing sales because i'll tell you what in my 20s it was hard i wasn't great to start with and it was like at times i'm like why am i doing this but it's so powerful that to stick it out because the lessons you learn from thousands of phone calls and thousands or hundreds of meets of, of people into in in face to face means that you you just have such a you tune in so well to what people are really like and no matter what your role is beyond that it's really going to stand you in good stead because it means you can be heard and understood and 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 you can ultimately get outcomes you're after because you're not inhibited by being able to articulate or communicate in the right way so embrace selling it's way more than just making a paycheck that's what i would tell myself yeah 100 percent and Look, you know, I'll give Grant Cardone a little shout out for one minute. And I don't often do this, but his book, Sell or mm. Be Sold, yeah. I think is that's my message, which is if you're not learning how to sell and you're not selling, you're being sold to. So totally. you're being ripped off, you know. Totally. So um, on, on just on that, it's a good segue. Final question, bonus yeah. question for everybody. Richard Moore, what book are you reading right now? Oh, I have so many, but I'm actually rereading um, Malcolm Gladwell's What the Dog Saw at the moment. Uh, really, nice. Yeah, it's a really interesting um, kind of view on why people do things in certain ways. Think Freakonomics, but the human side. So I, I definitely uh, suggest that. Also, another one that's similar that I finished a reread of, uh, I do a lot of rereading um, uh, about a month ago, is a book um, by a guy called M was two, Miller and Kanazawa, called Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters. And again, these are like little um, anecdotes on why people react in certain ways, why behaviorally certain things happen in the world. And um, I find it fascinating because it helps you understand human dynamics. And I love the title, Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters. I have two daughters, just saying. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there's so, no slight um, on you having a son, but yeah. You <laughs> um, so, um, so Richard Moore, tell us, how does everybody connect with you and find you? What's your favorite platform? Yeah, so there's this new one called LinkedIn, you know, you should check it and I'm on there. Um, so yeah, if you go to LinkedIn, I, I'm under, it's linkedin.com slash in slash Richard James Moore, all on word. Uh, there's also the.richard.more on Instagram or just the richardmore.com. Unfortunately, Richard Moore was taken. So uh, the richardmore.com, you can find me there. But hit me up on LinkedIn. I'd love to... Uh, support or help with any questions anyone's got but in the meantime i really appreciate it. i've really enjoyed myself thank you mate no 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 worries at all like it's always a lot of fun and i think we should do this again we'll do it like a, a take two we might do like a little how to because we're we're getting some how to stuff going um in terms That's of sponsoring perfect. content so uh we'll we'll organize that for everybody so um we'll put richard's contact details in the description so if you are listening on the podcast go and check out the youtube channel because we'll post splintered videos of this interview on the YouTube channel, um, and you will find in the description on the YouTube channel uh, Richard's contact details and all of his links. This has been the Kobe Simmons Audio Experience. It's great to have everybody here. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and make sure that you've turned on your notifications because we always forget to do that. And at the moment, we're getting notifications from our news broadcasters about what's going on with the pandemic. I'm sick of hearing that, and this is much <laughs> more fun. So yeah. um, this has been the Kobe Simmons Audio Experience. Lots of fun. Thanks to the team at Best Practice, Luke specifically for sitting in on this interview and everybody in the team at Best Practice and the marketing team, they're doing a great job making the two of us look really good. Absolutely. And uh, thanks very much. Bye for now. It's been great having you on, mate. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Can't wait to do it again. Cool. Bye for now. Cheers.